Good evening, everyone, and thank you for attending our book event tonight. I'm Guy Lamolinar, and I'm from the Center for the Book here in the Library of Congress. And this event is par part of a week's worth of events we're doing related to Frankenstein. Um, we're having film screenings. We have a display of items from the library's collections over in the Jefferson Building. And all of these are meant to celebrate the 200th anniversary of Mar Mary Shelley's novel Frankenstein and its extraordinary global influence on popular culture. It's now my pleasure to introduce our program. Charlotte Gordon is an award-winning author whose work has appeared in the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, and the Washington Post, among many other publications. Her latest book, Romantic Outlaws, The Extraordinary Lives of Mary Wollstonecraft and Mary Shelley, won the National Book Critics Circle Award. Charlotte has also published Mistress Bradstreet, The Untold Story of America's First Poet, and The Woman Who Named God, Abraham's Dilemma and the Birth of Three Faiths. Most recently, Charlotte wrote the introduction to Penguin's reissue of Mary Shelley's Frankenstein. A distinguished professor of the humanities at Endicott College, Gordon speaks frequently at colleges and conferences and has been interviewed on numerous NPR programs across the country. Charlotte's distinguished interviewer is Michael Durda. Michael is a Pulitzer Prize winning book columnist for the Washington Post and the author most recently of Browsings, a year of reading, collecting, and living with books. His other publications include several collections of essays, the memoir, An Open Book, and the Edgar Award winning on Conan Doyle. In another life, Michael earned a PhD in comparative <laughs> literature from Cornell University with a concentration on medieval studies and European romanticism. He is currently at work on The Great Age of Storytelling, an appreciation of late 19th and early 20th century popular fiction. Please welcome Charlotte Gordon and Michael Durda. Uh, Charlotte and I spoke uh, beforehand, and she's going to give a short presentation based on her study of Mary Wollstonecraft and Mary Shelley, and then we'll kind of launch into a casual conversation about what, both what she said and uh, these two interesting women, but also about Frankenstein. I urge you to think of questions to ask us. It's always much more fun, particularly when you have a relatively small group to interact with the audience. So, uh, you know, uh, th think about the, the novel, think about uh, the things you'd like to know about uh, Mary Shelley or Mary Wollstonecraft or Frankenstein. So, when I was a young teacher, I used to always teach Frankenstein. And, you know, honestly, I knew nothing about it other than, like, all the cliches that Frankenstein, the first, you know, science fiction novel. And, you know, Mary Shelley, whatever. I knew about her, but not really. And so it was with great surprise <laughs> that I found out that, in fact, Mary Shelley was the daughter of Mary Wollstonecraft. I'm a highly educated individual. So how this slipped my, you know, my teacher's mind and mine is beyond me. So um, in this image, I just wanted people to see these images. Um, the picture of the woman in white is Mary Wollstonecraft. And in this picture, she's actually pregnant with Mary Shelley, who is in the black, looking kind of tired at this point in her life because she's been through a lot. Um, when I found out that Wollstonecraft was the mother of Mary Shelley, I thought that was so interesting. And I thought, well, of course, cool, radical woman who wrote A Vindication of the Rights of Woman, of course she's going to be the daughter of cool, radical Mary Shelley who wrote Frankenstein. She must have influenced her so much because I knew nothing about Mary Wollstonecraft. I did not know that 10 days after she gave birth to Mary Shelley, Mary Wollstonecraft died. My theory went right out the window. I thought, wait, how does cool, radical author of Vindication of the Rights of Woman influence cool writer of Frankenstein? And then I thought about myself, the fact that I was even asking these questions. I mean, I'm profoundly influenced by dead people. So is Michael, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> of course, Mary. I see them. <laughs> <laughs> of course, little Mary was going to be influenced by her mother. And in fact, that portrait that I just showed you of Mary Wollstonecraft in the white dress hung in little Mary Shelley's house. 
and lots of other interesting things as well. But I wanted to quickly give you a kind of overview of things that a lot of people don't know about the novel. And in some ways, we could call this little introduction Frankenstein's grandmother, <laughs> because really, Frankenstein, when I came to think about it and I came to read about these women, in many ways, Frankenstein is a tribute to Mary Wollstonecraft. And whenever I say that to my students, they say, but wait, there's no strong women in this novel. It seems to be all about, you know, it's dystopian. And the only person who, see, who seems to have any power at all is Dr. Frankenstein. How can this be a, what we would say in academia be, how could this be a proto-feminist novel? How can this be a novel about the need for strong women? And what I came to understand is that really Frankenstein is in fact a story about what the world would look like without mothers, without strong women. That it is a dystopian picture of a world where women don't have power and are effectively disenfranchised. And so this interested me, when I realized this, this interested me all the more in Mary Wollstonecraft. So I'm going to just flip through some quick images so that we can have a sense of who she is because this will put us all on the same, you know, the, a level playing field. So I went on a kind of pilgrimage to find out more about Mary Wollstonecraft long before I knew I was going to write about her in my book, Romantic Outlaws. And this is a picture of the house we think that she grew up in in North, northern England in Yorkshire. And because I'm a writer, of course, I had to have a picture of the window we think she stared out of when she was super glum and depressed when she was 16. Why was she glum and depressed? She had a horrible family. Her father was an alcoholic. Her mother was very weak. And Mary's earliest memories actually are of falling asleep on the threshold of her parents' bedroom door to protect her mother from her abusive father. And all of that happened in this house that we see here. For the rest of her life, she would be anti-marriage, and she's an 18th century woman. And to be married in the 18th century meant, and my student, none of my students ever know this, so forgive me if I'm telling you, I, you look like you already know all this, but I still have to say it. Um, you couldn't own property. Children were not your own. Um, there was no such thing as divorce. It took quite literally an act of parliament to get divorced. Your husband's responsibility was to discipline you, which meant essentially um, that he could punish you, what we would call abuse, abuse you freely. Why? Because an out of order family meant an out of order or uncontrolled town, which meant an out of control, you know, wild county which meant the whole country would be wild and uncontrolled and England would turn into France and, you know, who knew what would happen? A revolution, maybe. Um, so the great humane innovation of the 18th century was that husbands should not use a whip that was thicker than the thumb, and that's where we get the idea of the rule of thumb. Mary Wollstonecraft was outraged by this, and she spent essentially the rest of her life after this early experience with her parents trying to write the injustices that she saw growing up. But first she was really depressed. And then a very beloved mentor said, you know, I think you should read this person named John Locke. I think you'll find him really inspirational. And whenever I say John Locke to my students, their eyes roll back in their head with boredom. And I have to remind them that in fact, in the 18th century, John Locke was considered so radical that he wasn't even allowed on the campus at Oxford. I mean, he was really a shocking person to read. And in 1775, which is the very same year that Mary Wollstonecraft was reading John Locke, so was John Adams, so was Jefferson. He was, he was in fact, literally inspiring revolutions. And for Wollstonecraft, he inspired her to think that women, in fact, could have the same <gasps> rights as men. And so, I thought that it would be interesting just to hear Locke's words for one second because we're a small nerdy group in here. I feel that you can, you can stand it, right? So Locke said, the state of nature is one of equality. I feel like we should all, <laughs> of equality, wherein all the power and jurisdiction is reciprocal, no one having more than another. When Wollstonecraft read that in 1775, 
she had found a political and philosophical underpinning for her feelings that life wasn't fair. Her father should not be allowed to treat her mother that way. And in fact, Mary had an older brother who was tyrannical, and he should not be allowed to treat her that way either. She, we're going to skip through some of these fascinating images. Um, Lots of interesting things happen in her life, many of which are actually, from my point of view, very funny. But by the time she's 31, she's tried out all the different things that you can do as a woman if you don't get married, because she is against marriage. So what are the options for you in the mid-18th century? Well, if you don't want to sink down the food chain to become a prostitute, you can be a governess, fun. Mary, there's many funny stories about Wollstonecraft as a governess, however. The idea of hiring Mary Wollstonecraft as a governess still <laughs> amuses me. But anyways, Wollstonecraft was a governess. She was a companion to an elderly woman who had a history of intimidating her companions, but not when it came to Wollstonecraft. She was scared of Wollstonecraft, which I think tells us a lot about Wollstonecraft. She started a school that was so radical no one would send their students there. <laughs> it was like all classic Wollstonecraft. By the time she's 31, this is how she presents herself to the world. And if you know other portraits of women during this time, they're often holding like little frilly parasols and like, you know, trying to look marriageable and pretty. And this picture is a definite self-representation of self as scholar, or in my mind, as prime minister. She's really, this is an anti, um, well, I don't want to use the words feminine and masculine, but this is very much a conscious depiction of self as serious-minded individual. She does not want to be seen as a woman in the 18th century sense. She's not anti-woman, but she is anti the images of women that people had in the 18th century. She comes to fame by writing A Vindication of the Rights of Woman. And when she wrote A Vindication of the Rights of Woman, no one said to her, gee, thanks so much for writing A Vindication of the Rights of Woman. They said, you are a whore, Mary Wollstonecraft. You are a hyena in petticoats. But she persevered. And I will speed up our life story just a little bit more, but she the French Revolution breaks out, and Wollstonecraft, as opposed to all the rest of the English who are fleeing home from Paris, Wollstonecraft gets on the first ship she can to go become the first female war correspondent in Paris, which she loves. She, when she gets to France, there's a lot of violence, as we know. She arrives just as the king is about to be executed. He gets executed. She doesn't really like all this bloodshed, but she's totally behind the revolution. It's like, yes, this is how life should be. Rich people should be on the run. Poor people should be rising up. Women should be able to get divorced. They should have equal rights. This is great. She falls in love with a sexy American named Gilbert. She gets pregnant. They have a baby. Life is great. She's living her philosophy. He doesn't believe in marriage either, which is a kind of enforced servitude of women, he says. This is terrific. And then he leaves her. She's got this little baby. She's super depressed. What is she going to do? She goes and tracks him down. He's living with an actress. Um, she says to them, you know, how about the three of us live together? Um, then you and I, Gilbert, can talk about ideas and be philosophical soulmates. And you, young woman, do you have an education? And what are you going to do when he gets tired of you? How are you going to earn a living? The young woman is like, get out of my life. You may not live with us. Go away. So Mary gets super depressed. Um, sad things happen. She tries to kill herself. Gilbert, in all of his wisdom, says to her, listen, one of my merchant ships, stay with me here, has gone missing in Scandinavia. I'm wondering if you could go find it for me, and then maybe, you know, maybe we could get back together if you find this ship. Scandinavia, <laughs> merchant ships. Nobody in this time period went to Scandinavia. Men did not go to Scandinavia, but the suicidal Mary Wollstonecraft with her toddler go to Sweden where in fact she roams around in the beautiful Scandinavian summer you know smelling the pines and picking strawberries and admiring waterfalls and at night she comes home and she writes about how much better nature is making her feel and when she comes back to England Gilbert's like well you didn't find my ship she didn't find a ship I'm going to go on living with my cute actress she gets depressed, but you know what she does? She revises all of her writings that she did in Scandinavia, 
and she publishes a book that most people have never heard of today, but was actually her best-selling book of the time called Letters from Scandinavia. And in Letters from Scandinavia, she writes about the healing properties of nature and how it gives her inspiration. And it's read by two young men. One was named William Wordsworth, and one was named Samuel Taylor Coleridge. And they said, wow, this is a really great way to write. Maybe we should try it. They greatly admired her. I was certainly never taught that Wollstonecraft was, in fact, one of the initiators of romanticism. But both Wordsworth and Coleridge, as they were here tonight, would say, in fact, we got a lot of our ideas from Mary Wollstonecraft. Mary Wollstonecraft meets a kind of rock star political philosopher named William Godwin, who read letters from Scandinavia and said, you know, if ever there were a book calculated to make the reader fall in love with the author, it's this book. They get together, she gets pregnant again, big quandary. What are we going to do? Neither of them believe in marriage. They've both written publicly about this. If they get married, they're going to be ridiculed by their friends. But if they don't get married, this little baby's going to be a bastard. What should they do? And if they do get, what about little fan? Oh, they get married. Their friends make fun of them. I want to show. There she is. She's pregnant with a baby. They move to that great neighborhood in the Polygon, which has since been torn down and is now North London. They get married in St. Pancras Old Church, which is right near St. Pancras Railroad Station. And everything, again, is great, though their friends have made fun of them. Mary gives birth. Uh, it's a little girl. Her name is Mary. Everyone's worried that the little girl won't survive, but it seems to be OK. And then the tragedy happens. Mary Wollstonecraft dies of childbed fever just 10 days after giving birth. And in fact, William Godwin is heartbroken. So that little Mary Shelley's first memories as a teeny little girl are walking to the graveyard and actually learning to read on her mother's gravestone. And this is true. This is not apocryphal. The first words that she learns to trace and the first letters are M, you know, Mary Wollstonecraft Godwin, which was in fact little Mary Shelley's original name, Mary Godwin. And the gravestone, you can't see it here, the gravestone actually said author of a vindication of the rights of woman. So I don't know about you guys. I mean, my first words, I think, were like dog and cat. But I think little Mary Shelley's, her first words were vindication and woman. Which again, most people don't know this, but this is part of the origin story, of course, of Frankenstein, which is why I'm telling you all of this, because I would much rather be chatting with Michael. But I want us all to know this um, so that when our conversation begins, you can know some of these. Uh, it's kind of an invisible backstory to this really incredibly famous novel. So by the time Mary has kind of, little Mary has come of age, even by the time she's 10 or 11, she's pretty much decided that she wants to live according to the ideals of her mother. By the time she meets this handsome young man, Percy, um, she's 16 and he's 20. And inconveniently, he's already married. But neither of them believe in marriage, <laughs> no problem. And so she says to him, he does not say to her, she says to him, you know, my, my heart is with you, Percy, or whatever exactly she said. He said, great. Um, she says, you know, you're already married, so we're going to have to run away together. He's like, fine. Where should we go? And she says, well, Paris, because that's where my mother went. So they do. They run away together to Paris. She's 16. I'm leaving out an important character, but I, that's OK. Um, and what do they take with them? They don't take you know, sexy lingerie. They take a giant stack of Mary Wollstonecraft's books that they read to each other. So I tell all of this to you as a kind of backstory so that you can understand that by the time young Mary sits down to write Frankenstein. It's really only two years after she's run away with Percy to Paris. They go to Geneva, and if you, I think Michael and I can talk about this, but she starts writing the ghost story, Frankenstein, when she's 17-ish, 18 years old, and it's published before she's 20. And so she, is, she says, I am doing this in part to live up to my mother and my father. And so I'm going to leave it there, but this is the backstory of Frankenstein that most people don't know. And I wanted you to know the history of the women behind Frankenstein, because it's kind of famously 
Um, you know, women are so famously absent from it. And I think now Michael and I could talk, but I want to get the picture of the house where it was, um, where we think <coughs> it was actually begun. This is the Via Diodati in Geneva where Lord Byron makes his famous challenge, which we can talk about if you want to hear it. Thank you, that was great. You're welcome. Well, I wanted to ask a question of the audience first. Uh, you know, I once taught Frankenstein in college at a course I gave. And, I, and I, I told the class that I would give an A to anyone in the class who could tell me the first words hmm. that the creature speaks in the novel. Not the first, the, 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 it's a, it, they're, wonder, they're th three wonderful words. Pardon this intrusion, which tells you a lot about the novel already, if, if you have these images of the movie in mind, which is strictly oh. a horror movie. Oh, that's lovely. Whereas the novel is very much a philosophical account of all sorts of issues dealing with science, creation, moral responsibility, uh, what it means to be civilized, educated. It's, it's, a, it's a book, you know, you know it's, it's a book to think with, not simply to react to. But let's go to the, to the background of how the, how the book came about. Uh, Charlotte's told us about Mary Wollstonecraft and a bit about Mary Shelley. Um, not, Mary, not Shelley yet, still Mary Godwin. She runs off with uh, Shelley, taking her half-sister with her, <laughs> Claire Claremont. Um, and true. They, the, 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 the whole situation of the romantics <sighs> is, is so tangled and exhausted. Uh, erotically. Everybody, um, it's, it's like the 60s. Everybody <laughs> sleeps with everybody else, practically. Um, uh, they get involved after they, they, you know, Percy Shelley apparently at one point when uh, Mary Shelley has had a child that has died, runs off with Claire for a while, comes back. They, they eventually all end up at the, the Villa Diodati on Lake Geneva with Lord Byron. And um, it's been a terrible summer. No, they called it the because of some volcano erupted mm -hmm. or something. Mm -hmm. There was you know terrible weather, and they decided to tell these ghost stories. Interestingly, they had a they had a visitor early in the in the uh, that same period when they were there of uh, a character named Matthew Gregory Lewis. <laughs> Do any of you know who Matthew Gregory Lewis was? He he was yes. he was the author of the great Gothic novel of the time, The Monk which again is filled with sex and all sorts of <laughs> naughtiness. Uh, so these things were in the air. Um, all the, uh, the, the, the characters are interested in new ideas, uh, electricity and galvanism. There's, they've, they've got this, they're, they're, they're living in the middle of, a, a, of, the, of you know, the time of the Gothic romances. And so they decide that they're going to tell ghost stories. Why don't you tell, tell, tell us about what ghost stories they came up with? Well, I think there's, there's, there's many interesting stories about this story, which is um, Lord Byron says famously, and Mary tells us this story in her introduction to the revised Frankenstein. So if you're a critical reader, you have to think about the story that she's telling and why she tells the story. But she says that Byron set a challenge to everybody who was there, to the assembled, saying essentially, <laughs> I'm translating now, uh, you know, I'm sick of all the books we're reading. We all are. We're bored. Let's see who can write the scariest ghost story. And there, Michael's going to fill this in, but I'm going to tell my part of it, which is um, the part I care about because I teach students who have many silly ideas about this story. And it comes from Mary herself. So the way she tells it, Byron and Shell, everybody got right to work. They had no difficulty. But she, Mary, struggled to come up with an idea, alas. But then a dream came to her, a dream vision came to her, and then she was able to write it down. OK. Um, 
she writes that many years after everybody else has died. And by this time, people know who wrote Frankenstein. When it was first published, it was anonymous, and most people thought it was written by a man, perhaps Percy. Uh, when they find out that it was written by a woman, they say, what kind of monstrous woman would have come up with this novel? This is perverse, a perversity. And so Mary, who by this time is a single mom living back in London, trying to make a living, has been exiled essentially by London society for years for running away with Percy and Claire, um, <laughs> living what the, what the British press called living in the midst of the League of Incest. Uh, so I know. So I know, shocking. Shelley once said, incest, like so many other uh, in, 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 uh, incorrect things, is a very poetical circumstance. This was, <laughs> oh, they're right, I know, I love that. They're trying to talk him out, his publisher's trying to talk him out of making his two main characters, who are lovers, brother and sister, he says. Hey, work for Brian. Right. Brian. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, um, here's what we know about what really happened. Because everybody who was up there, not only were they sleeping with everybody, um, they were also keeping journals and writing letters. And there was one young man up there who had a giant crush on Mary and recorded her every action, Polidori. And in fact, he says she got right to work. And there's no evidence of her having any difficulty writing this book. In fact, there's not even evidence of the dream. So why does she tell this story? It seems clear that she tells this story to kind of make it more acceptable to the reading audience that this woman wrote this book. I didn't mean to, it came to me in a dream. And for those people who were initiated, who knew anything about romantics, only special people, of course, had dreams like this. So on the other hand, it was also a kind of, what do we, my, again, I've just learned this phrase, I think it's probably old now, it's sort of a humble brag to say, you know, oh, I didn't have the idea myself, it came in a vision, is a very romantic thing to happen, but it also excused her on a very deep level from being this monstrous woman who came up this, with this idea herself. So that's, in all of the introductions to Frankenstein, often that story is retold, and I find it irritating because <laughs> I would like people to understand that Shelley Mary Godwin at that point and then Mary Shelley, when she revises it, took herself very seriously as a craftsperson and worked very hard from the moment she started writing that manuscript. She didn't stop for two years. And we have the notebooks of the second draft so we can see how hard she worked and what she did. Sorry, I just no, have to correct no, that. Yeah. Polidori, by the way, <laughs> was, the, was the only other person to really produce any uh, important work of uh, supernatural literature. He wrote a book, a novella called The Vampire, where the vampire is essentially based on Byron. In fact, when it was published, people thought Byron had written it. <laughs> uh, and it, it really set the, 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 the ideal of the, the vampire as a brooding, elegant, uh, intensely sexy and romantic figure. And it goes all the way back you know, to the present. But um, Polidori, also, you know, these families are intrinsically connected. The Polidori sister became the mother of Dante Gabriel Rossetti and the Rossetti family. So they're, they're the, the wonderful connections. Claire Claremont, to finish up with her, was the only one to, to live to any great length. She lived to be a great old lady, became a governess for a long time. But she served as the model for Henry James's great story, The Aspirin Papers. So. Uh, uh, a lot came out of this small circle. Now, can we say one more thing about Claire? Sure. Um, there is a recent discovery, which for people like us, I'm including you in the us, was very exciting. So a lot of us have wondered um, how did people really feel about the sexual experimenting that was going on, and you know, Percy and Byron, but especially Percy was he used the phrase free love. And Mary was always trying to live up to like his standards of free love and tried to sleep with his friends and stuff, but she didn't really want to. <laughs> um, so we just found in the public library in, in, in New York, um, in between the pages of a book, Claire Claremont saying, in fact, free love for women was horrible. It was a terrible experience for us. Um, it was great for the men on some level, but we suffered.
Now, having said that, she was the model for James, and she spent a lot of time rewriting her history and her letters. So this was a rewritten, um, who knows what the mood of the day was, but still I think it's very interesting that, that the woman's experience of this kind of commune was very different from the men's. Not that the men were having such a great time either, and by the way, and do you know that, like I feel like it's like common, common knowledge that Byron's, Byron's main erotic interest besides his half-sister and other women um, were actually, was actually men. And it seems very clear that he had a very deep interest in Percy. And I forget who it was in England was you know, mm. bent out of shape that I wrote that in my books. <laughs> well, there's been all, I know. The, the, his early travels, he talks a lot yes. about the, the Greek and Arab boys that he would see. Now, you stress the importance of Mary Wollstonecraft, but Mary Shelley dedicates the book to her father, yes. William Godwin. And Godwin himself was an extremely interesting both thinker, but also novelist. Uh, Caleb Williams is one of the earliest detective stories, sort of a chase thriller, but he also wrote a couple of sort of gothic-y novels himself mm -hmm. um, about the Saint, Saint, Saint Leon or Saint Leon, Saint Leon, uh, about the, the search for the elixir of life. And just to continue with men, uh, men a little bit, Shelley also wrote a couple of sort of crummy gothic novels where you have <laughs> gigantic men or creatures mm -hmm. and gothic elements like the elixir of life to extend life. Why, why do you feel that Mary Wollstonecraft was so much an influence when we have examples from the men in her life working the same field, essentially, mm -hmm. as she does? Um, I think that they were a huge influence on her as well. I'm just trying to correct the fact that most people don't know that Wollstonecraft was also an influence. So. I think everything you're saying is spot on. And in fact, I also think Frankenstein can be read as part of a kind of marital dispute between Percy and Mary, because Percy writes a book called, a, a long poem called Prometheus Unbound. And of course, we know that Frankenstein's subtitle is A Modern Prometheus. And so this was part of an ongoing quarrel that they were having as, as two very close people between pessimism and optimism, but also between many other ideals about how to live a life. And I think in some ways it's self-evident that, that, that Dr. Frankenstein's obsessive ambition and commitment to work at the expense of his personal relationships that Mary is saying, not good. Um, Percy, on the other hand, admires it. Like he admires Prometheus and he's like, go, yes, we can solve the world's problems through this kind of ambition. And so I think every, I'm so glad, it's, this is why it's so great to have you know, the in tandem discussion of Frankenstein because I'm so much intent on kind of correcting the historical record that has left Wollstonecraft out that I will sometimes not even mention the influence of Godwin and Percy. And Godwin was a huge influence for many, many reasons that I can talk about now or not. I don't know if you know, that's well, of interest. Let me ask you a question about uh, you, you brought up the, the later introduction mm -hmm. to the 1831 mm -hmm. text, which he revised. For a long time, that was what people read. Yes. But in the last couple of decades, the original 1818 text has come to be preferred. What happened? What is different between the two? Why did we have this shift from the later text? For a long time, textual scholars you say you take the, the author's last corrected version as the, you know, the foundational text. But that's not the case anymore no. in the case of Frankenstein. Why not? What happened? And I want to see if I can keep, your, you all are so nice to be out here tonight, I have to see if I can keep you interested. <laughs> so, because um, this can get, it could get arcane fast. Um, the 1818 edition, that's the one that I just wrote the introduction for, Penguin, is the, it's the first one. It's less, there's, there's, it's shorter. Um, it's one that Percy was more directly involved in. And if you look at the, the draft manuscript, you can see in his handwriting his emendations, which are very interesting for us to see. 
1831, she does, of course, Percy's long dead, so is Byron. And so one of the reasons why that was the edition most people read is it was seen as more merry. Um, it, was, it, it has her revisions, no one is working on it with her. In, with second wave feminists in the 1970s and 80s, the text becomes a little suspect because the women seem to get weaker, feminist theorists say. Um, they, it seems like it's becoming a more, one of the, the, the tropes, one of the ideas about Mary Shelley, which is another reason why I wrote my book, um, was that Mary Shelley was seen as starting life as a revolutionary when she runs away with Percy, and then becoming kind of interpolated, becoming kind of corrupted by Victorian ideals about what a woman should be like, that, that the story went that she was so interested in fitting in that she was willing to sell out those original revolutionary ideas. And that was most famously promulgated by the great biographer Richard Holmes in his very beautiful biography of Percy Shelley, where he kind of puts Mary down, elevates Claire, and has since apologized for this and no longer you know, holds to this idea. But this, really? yeah, really? yeah, which is great. Um, <laughs> but so there was, there was sort of a, uh, what's the word? Like a, not a kickback, there was, there was, people didn't like this idea about Mary Shelley. They wanted to see her as more revolutionary. And the 1831 edition for a while was seen as more of a kind of sellout, a, a sellout edition. Now, I would say for most scholars and most teachers, there's, for most, there's in fact a pretty equal divide about which edition you're gonna teach. Currently, the 1818 one is more in fashion, but the 1831 is also super interesting because you can see what Mary adds in. Well, what does she add in? There's more philosophy. If anything, there's, there's more ideas it's not more action, but there's more reading, there's more literature, there's more discussion of what is the nature of creation, why are we here. Um, it doesn't read as quickly. So students, in fact, find it a little bit more difficult even than the 1818, which does read more like a teenage girl despite Shelley's emendations, which are pretty funny. So this is, I'm gonna stop discussing this because there's been, yes, I don't wanna lose our, the, well, you the whole question here. of Shelley's emendations oh, so funny. Has, given, has given rise, I gather, to a, a school of thought uh, that, in no, fact... a tiny group uh, of stupid... I, uh, that <laughs> Shelley himself actually wrote the book. So, I mean, this... I mean, I'm not giving it any necessary credence, but, he, but I've, the, the, there, he did a, a good deal of scribbling around with the manuscript Supposedly, he was, you know, an editor just giving the usual response of a, you know, a spouse to a, a, a writing partner's uh, work. But um, what is the what is the reason that people think that Shelley could have that, that is the, the male Shelley could have written the book? This is so. I wish all of my talks could have. This is so great. You're asking all the greatest questions. I used to know the numbers by heart because this question so. Um, engaged me is the polite way to put it. And so I don't want to say the numbers because I'll get them wrong, but they're in my book. I think he adds, we know almost exactly how many words he added to the 1818 edition, in part because of the work, the amazing scholarship of Charles Robinson at the University of Delaware, who went through the notebooks and did a kind of coding, because you can see his handwriting versus her handwriting. I'm tempted just to say how many words. It's like 7,000 words out of 80,000 words, or it's the percentage is very small, far less, for example, than the percentage of emendations that Ezra Pound does to T.S. Eliot's The Wasteland. And you know, there's never been this debate about, well, in some circles, there is a debate about but, who really but wrote Pound the just cuts, yes. but per Percy adds. Percy adds and cuts. Percy's emendations tend to be changing vocabulary from kind of um, simple verbs to fancier verbs. He puts in a very funny, one of my favorites is when she's talking about the Alps and, and, and Switzerland, he puts in, that's one of his longest ones, it's about this long, where suddenly we're like, I, I think it's during one of the chase scenes, and suddenly there's this pause in the narrative where we get a, a history about um, Republican values, the, the values of democracy in Switzerland and how it's always been a more free country. And you're like, wait, 
I thought I was reading a gothic novel, but in fact, suddenly, <laughs> I'm reading political philosophy, it seems, by someone else. So I think there's, there's teeny little moments like that, but essentially, it's, it is her story. They talk about it. Um, and that, that, but that really interesting structure of Frankenstein that never goes away, that sort of Russian doll structure where we have the story within the story and that balanced story, that is Mary's. That is Mary's. It's not Percy's. His, his idea is, I mean, maybe the better analogy is um, Fitzgerald to um, Max Perkins than Pound mm -hmm. to Eliot. I mean, but I think even that is too active an analogy that Percy does, she does hand, we can see mm. the manuscript. She, they sat in bed together with his writing desk and she would hand it over to him. And he did act as a kind of editor. You can see him fixing the commas, giving her some fancier verbs here and there, but not actually altering that overall sort of idea, the structure. Unless you want to say that talking about ideas before you're writing it is writing the book, but it was her book. It was her book, and he was a beloved editor. But we also don't say about Percy's poems that she wrote his poems. And as some of you know, he, he died with all of his papers in great disarray. So if you look at his notebooks in the Bodleian, you can see parts of stories written on different pieces of paper, parts of poems. Some of his most famous poems are, in, are written on literally different sheets of paper. So who puts those together? Who's the miracle editor there? Mary, and she probably does much more active editing of Percy's work than he really does of thinking through the sort of novelistic ideas of Frankenstein, but never has his work, you know, never has his authorship been challenged. So just, see my students taught me this too, just saying um, <laughs> that, <laughs> um, I, think, I think that we can let that, the question of authorship of Frankenstein rest, but it's a very interesting it's, it's interesting historically that we've questioned it. I think it tells us a lot about you know, the his, history of women and literature. Shelley was the first poet I ever discovered. I was sitting in a parking lot behind a department store, and I noticed a bunch of kids prowling through a, one of these huge dumpsters. And they came out with a pile of records. Huh. Huge, someone must have hidden them there. And I jumped out of the car and I said, give me some of those. Hmm. And I took them home, and one of them was Poems of Shelley, read by Vincent Price. No. And I put it on my record player, and I was just enchanted. Some of them, I, you know, some of them are, were incredibly corny. I can remember to this day. I arise from dreams of thee mm. in the first sweet sleep of night, when the winds are breathing low and the stars are shining bright. I arise from dreams of thee and a spirit in my feet hath led me who knows how to thy chamber window sweet. I die, I faint, I fail. He goes on. Oh, it's hit my <laughs> microphone. I, I, think that's uh, the, I think that's how they talk to each other. <laughs> well, you mentioned, mentioned uh, when the, Mary Wollstonecraft in, in Paris and uh, Wordsworth, of course, Wordsworth was in Paris as well during the, the revolution and wrote about it in the prelude. And I've always thought that uh, he wrote about Paris in the way I think about the 60s. Yes. There's a, a couplet. Bliss was it in that dawn to be alive, but to be young was very heaven. Frankenstein is a very strange book in a number of ways. I mean, we think of the story as a, this scary story, but we know it's a, a philosophical romance, but there is even this sort of strange, kind of Arabian tale of this family mm -hmm. of a, a Christian mm -hmm. convert. Mm -hmm. and elements that, and we, you know, it ends up in the North Pole where they're just going over the ice like something out of the ancient Mariner, which was an apparent influence. Um, do you have any sense of why the novel has such a strange structure, why it brings in all these disparate elements? I mean, he. He leaves, I guess, Geneva or wherever he was, he was or Germany, I guess, where he made the, the original creature, goes to the Orkney Islands to make the female. And then he has a change of heart in the middle of everything and destroys, destroys it. Um, the book is, is, is provocative, and yet it seems so almost inconclusive 
in a way that might be useful. Now you can, it, you know, it can support all kinds of theories, all kinds mm -hmm. of interpretations. Mm -hmm. when, you teach this, when you teach the novel, what do you try to emphasize? What, what elements particularly uh, appeal to you and your students? Um, of course, I want to ask Michael that question and ask all of you that question. But um, one of the topics that we have just been discussing is how she gives equal weight, because we've been talking a lot about this in the current political climate. So Sh Shelley gives, I hate to call her Shelley because in 1818 she was still Godwin, but Shelley gives equal weight to Dr. Frankenstein's point of view and the creature's point of view. And there's something, I think, intrinsically ethical about that, which um, if we want to talk about you know, our, our current climate, we can. But I think that, that she's really putting a lot on the reader to ask these questions so that Michael is so exactly right. It is a kind of unresolved, intrinsically unresolved novel because we have these different points of view that are given equal weight. And we also have this kind of offstage audience which is the sister of the explorer. Now, I know you have, for those of you who haven't read this novel in a while. It's all written as letter. Yes, you might have forgotten this, but in fact, it's the novel begins with the explorer writing to his sister who has the very same initials that Mary will have when she, may, when she marries Percy, MWS. And so this, this sister seems to be the only person um, who has any kind of reasonable ideas about how to live life because the explorer is always saying to his sister, don't, don't worry, I, I'll try to like save my life and that of my men, and, but I don't want to fail and turn back from exploring you know, the pole. But you can hear her, you never, we never get to hear it directly, but we can hear in the background the sort of invisible chorus, come home, relationships matter, stay connected, be in community. You don't need to go be this solo explorer in the Arctic, you can be human and part of community, but I think it's so interesting that that voice is implicit. Mm -hmm. We hear, the book seems to be a reaction to that. So that's of interest to me. I always try to point out, you know, why she doesn't, she didn't have to do that, right? We could have just had one version of the story, but why do we have these different versions of the story layered against each other? I think that's so interesting. Um, and then, of course, the biograph, can I just say one more biographical sure. thing? One more biographical piece of information, and I think Michael and I were probably, I don't know if this went on at Cornell, but we might have been trained similarly. You may not realize this, but it's a scandalous thing to do to look at an author's biography when you're reading a text. So all of my professors were new critics, and you were only supposed to look at the text and not think about the author's life at all. So every time I write a biography, I always am plagued by guilt because, of course, that's what I'm doing. I'm mining their lives so for the reading of this, you know, the book. So when you read Frankenstein, especially the 1818 version, I just want to tell you something, that as she was writing this, she endured two horrible tragedies. One was, if you remember Mary Wollstonecraft's first daughter, little Fanny, um, little Fanny is three years older than, than Mary, and they were very close. But Fanny lost her mother when her mother died, and Gilbert, the stupid, sexy American, vanished and never came back. So Fanny never really had her own parents, although Godwin adopted her. He was very clear that his own daughter was superior to Fanny. I mean, he loved Fanny, kind of. But, I mean, she wasn't as sparkly and amazing as his own daughter. And so when Mary is revising this, this novel, Fanny kills herself. And another horrible suicide happens at the same time, which is if you remember, Percy had been married when he ran away with Mary, and his abandoned wife also killed herself during the revising of this book. So there is a way in which I also think Mary is writing about, um, I love that, I, I'd forgotten that those are the first words. That's so beautiful, that Mary's really writing about how do we receive others? Um, that those women, they both died because they'd gotten exiled from their community. They'd gotten exiled because Fanny was a bastard. She was the daughter of a woman who'd had sex out of wedlock. Harriet, um, Percy's abandoned wife, dies in part because she's been abandoned by Shelley, but also because she'd become pregnant with another man who wasn't Shelley and so had become one of the monstrous women of that time period. 
So I think there's a sort of drumbeat of the dangers of what we do to one another, of people who trespass, who step out of their territory. And that's really the explanation of the, mon the creature, of the monster. Yeah. The creature gives for his murders. He said that he has been a misery, you know, just, just sheer misery that he's been uh, rejected, you know, alone. He's, he's educated himself by observing his family, learned, you know, read Paradise Lost, and John Locke, and every, everything. And, he's and yet highly he is, educated. Yet he is, he's, the world sees him as a monster, and it's, it's out that it is, you know, he has been made a monster by the world, not by Dr. Frankenstein. And I, yeah, and I think that that's where that ethical, she, you know, if she had just come out and written, if she had been her mother, she would have written a political essay about this. But by putting the narratives next to each other, we get to see how the, the creature um, has been abandoned and not parented. And how, in fact, he was so ready to be loved. I mean, there he is, reading yeah. Paradise Lost. And in fact, I wrote an essay for Slate about how I think Elon Musk needs to reread Frankenstein, <laughs> right? Because I think that really the moral of the story from, the, from that point of view is we need to take care of our inventions. We need to parent our, we need to parent our work when it goes into the world. We need to prepare the world for it, and then we need to parent it and nurture it, or it will become monstrous. And so Frankenstein, when we hear his story, we can understand why he does what he does, but we're better able to judge it by hearing that poor creature's point of view. You, you mentioned at the beginning that uh, Frankenstein is often regarded as the sort of the first real science fiction novel. Mm -hmm. You know, this is a view promulgated by the writer Brian Aldiss yeah. in, a, in a book called Billion Year Spree. What is it about Frankenstein that makes it a science fiction novel as opposed to some of the earlier, you know, candidates for these things like the you know, voyages to the moon you get from Cyrano de Bergerac mm -hmm. and the like? Uh, is, it, is it simply because it's a scientist who determines to uh, conduct a kind of experiment, and this is really the first such instance of this. Um, but, I just, I'm so. Yeah. I feel like Michael and I should now we should go right out to dinner. To well, <laughs> well, I mean, yes, it's course, such a great question. Yeah. So, Richard, but it also, you know, the, the interesting thing is that although we only remember Mary Shelley for Frankenstein, she went on to write other sort of science fictional and gothicy works. She wrote a novel about the elixir of life, called uh, a short story, The Mortal Immortal. Hmm. And she wrote a novel about essentially the end of the world. Yeah, the last man. The last man. Uh, and it is really, you know, ends with one, one guy left alive Roaming in the, the world. Earth. It's, a, it's, a, it's a, one of the great science fiction themes. There's others. Um, were, were the, were, were the, was there any influence on the novel you know of from legend, the Jewish legends of the Gollum? Oh, I, I've wondered that myself. I haven't found evidence, and I've wondered about that. I don't know. Mm -hmm. I don't and know. You know I the know story of the Gollum was the, created yeah. of, out of clay by a rabbi of, uh, of, of, of Prague and came alive to help protect the Jews of, of Prague. She, we have her, because Mary was Mary, she kept copious reading lists. I love, I love Mary. I mean, when she got sad and depressed, she taught herself ancient Greek. Um, like, you know, she was amazingly self-disciplined. And one of her disciplines was keeping a reading list of all the books that she read. And so we know what she was reading when she was mm -hmm. writing Frankenstein. And one of the most influential books that she and Percy read during this time were descriptions of slavery in the um, Barbados and Jamaica. In fact, they gave up sugar during this time. Um, mm -hmm. They were, you know, political activists, which was Richard Holmes' great contribution in his biography of Percy is showing how politically active Percy was. Um, but, but I think in terms of the science question, Holmes also wrote a book that I know Michael knows called The Age of Wonder, and I don't want to be- reviewed it. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, and something, something that I think um, that he knows as well as I do, and I think many of you know, is that in fact the word science as we know it today had very different meanings then. People weren't scientists, right? You did, you did science, and you were also a poet, and you might look at the stars, or if you're Percy, you might burn paper boats on a lake or sit up in a barn all night to see if a ghost would come. But that was all 
investigation. And so Mary wouldn't have seen, she would, she would have been confused by the word science the, as we use it. Um, the, for her, she would say that this book is a, is a story about imagination, obsession, ambition, men and women, community, uh, but she would say it's more about invention and imagination than science. You can see why we would call it science, right? We've got a guy essentially in a lab, we've got him in a lab, but I love, I love what he's reading. It's not like he's working with, test, you know, he's, <laughs> he's reading, you know, those crazies. Yeah. He's a great reader, Frankenstein. Well, I think a common view now is that Victor Frankenstein and the creature are in some ways twins. Yes. They're so Jekyll and Hyde Did you figures. see the National? The, did you see that production of Frankenstein? No. I, oh, I, oh, I know that yeah. uh, Benedict Cumberbatch yeah. and the Johnny Lee Miller uh, played the, the victor and the creature, and they would alternate yes. from the wheel, a day to day yes. on who was who, <laughs> whom. Um, but I didn't see it. Did you see it? Yes. Was it good? It was, it was, unbe yes, it was who, unbelievable. Who was, the, who was the monster and who was the... Uh, I saw it twice, so I you could see them both. Really? <laughs> <laughs> and which was better? <laughs> I, I know. I wanted to have an opinion. It's like we're reading the book, right? Yeah. I thought they were both amazing. They were wow. amazing. It was so sympathetic. And then I read the interview. Did you read the interviews with them about what it was like? No. I mean, I think it's to, to really responsibly read Frankenstein, I feel like you have to have that experience, right? Mm. To be Frankenstein and to be the creature. You, you have to embody both of those points of view, as well as the sister back home. I think maybe we should open to uh, some questions now. Yeah. Yes. Um, first of all, thank you. Yeah. That's amazing. I think uh, this this work is, as far as science fiction is concerned, I think what differentiates it from science is, for example, is the Wilson Doctrine, mm. which is a great science story about boys in school and mm. so on. And that's fantasy. It's science fiction. It's scientific mm -hmm. ideas that are more about Some future time proven, you know, more possible. But I, what I want to say is, um, along those lines, this is this is very today. It's very limiting to, to me, hmm. Frankenstein, because of the ability to for artificial intelligence and uh, and boys, perhaps. And this is a Faustian kind of tale, a Faustian humor. One of the lessons we might learn from it, especially now, when we can, we can become Dr. Frankenstein, mm -hmm. Dr. Frankens, is uh, what lines do you, can you cross? Well, mm -hmm. uh, to be Prometheus, mm -hmm. to bring, you know, <laughs> uh, you, to create life. And what is, is this a cautionary tale? Mm -hmm. or, and because if scientists can do it, they will do it. Maybe not in our country, but in other countries. And so, and I'm so sorry for now, we're going to have artificial intelligence, mm -hmm. probably. We're going to have androids. Are they slaves? Are they like, you know, like children? So it brings up a whole host of relevant questions. I'm going to repeat the gist of what he just said, and it was just for said. the uh, playback. Basically, uh, that Frankenstein seems all the more relevant today because of our uh, rapidly expanding technology into artificial intelligence and development of robots and androids. And more than ever, it's a useful cautionary tale about limits, about examining what we're actually doing when we create uh, new forms of intelligent beings, as the machines in some ways might be called. Um, and that's true. I mean, this is what, what it's, a, it's a book that we, we keep coming back to. I mean, uh, I guess the most famous revisiting of the novel, in, in a way, might be H.G. Um, Wells' is The Island of Dr. Moreau, mm -hmm. where we see, uh, uh, again, the creation of creatures out of, in this case, out of animals, mm -hmm. which are, are intelligent but with you know horrible consequences still. Are there other questions? 
the question was, did Mary Shelley have any inkling of how influential the book would become? It is the most taught book, apparently, um, at least in this country. I know, isn't that interesting? And my students, if I say really? Percy Shelley to them, they're like, who? If I say, and I say, he was married to Mary Shelley, the author of Frankenstein, and they all say, oh, I'm like you. <laughs> like I, <laughs> said, anyway, um, no, she didn't. She, I think 500 copies were the initial print run. They didn't sell out. She made no money from Frankenstein. She was in Italy when it did come out. When she came back home and it had been discovered that she was the author and she was you know, in social exile, um, by that time, playwrights and theater troupes, so the, you know, the, the 19th century ideas of movies, had taken the story. And in those times, you weren't protected if you were a novelist by copyright. So they could do whatever they wanted with with your story. So they were putting it on um, the London stage and there were protests against it. You know, people marching with placards saying this is, you know, immoral. But Frankenstein, she, she writes a letter saying, I've come home and found myself famous. So she knows that Frankenstein has become part of the popular conversation. And the word Frankenstein itself very quickly becomes not the scientist, but the monster. There's an early political cartoon that shows, I think it's the Irish, I forget. <laughs> this book now is five years, four years old. That's my only excuse. It's either the Irish are being depicted as a monster, the Frankenstein, or the English, I forget. Sorry. Um, but, it's, but the word Frankenstein and the elision between Frankenstein and the monster happens very early on. So she does know that it's you know, had sort of a cultural impact enough that she's going to be asked to revise it in 1831. And she becomes, you know, she, she starts to head the list of her publisher. Um, she, she is well known as a literary person, but she would never have dreamed that she would become a household name or that everybody would read Frankenstein ever. She would never have known that. I, I love the, uh, the first title for when it became a stage play. It was called Presumption. <laughs> or the fate of Frankenstein, and, uh, which tells you a lot right there. But um, certainly the James Whale movie and Boris Karloff have made it uh, universally recognizable. Do you feel any kind of resentment about the film, that it gives a false interpretation and view of the, the novel, and that too many people are, think that the the, the book is, in fact, something like the movie when it is very little like the movie. Do you? Um, do I? I'm, I've never been a movie person, so I'm a book guy. So, yeah, anything that will put down movies, you know, negatively, <laughs> it's, good, it's good as far as I'm concerned. Our culture is too involved with film as far as I'm concerned. But I'm out of place and out of time. So yes, I prefer the, I prefer the book because the book raises all sorts of questions yeah. that the movie just skirts. Yes. I'm interested to learn from your talk tonight the, um, how socially um, active they were about not simply sugaring after learning about the solution. And can I get can you tell us a little bit more about their social activism? Uh, they were, they were well, abolitionists. Yes. Uh, Free thinkers, atheists, yes. the, the work. Anti-merit, anti-institution. Yeah. Shelley, I mean, she, there's so many funny stories about Shelley. I don't know which one of us should jump on that. So the question were is, they, were they out campaigning Shelley was, against yes. Slavery? Um, so the question was, how, how active were they, um, were Shelley and Mary? Yeah. Um, so we can both hmm. answer this. But one of the great contributions that Richard Holmes does is he gives us a full, and this book is very, very old. It's his first biography, and it's a famous biography of Percy Shelley. And he gives us this complete picture of Percy as essentially a radical. And thanks to Mary, who for many strategic reasons paints the dead Percy as a kind of angelic Victorian figure, we almost lose track of the, the sort of bad boy Percy. She says, you know, he dies early because he was too good for this world. She makes it, she mentions never any of his atheism, his ag none of this is mentioned um, when his editions of poems come out so that they'll sell and people will read them. 
But there's many famous stories about Percy. He's kicked out of Oxford for writing a tract about atheism. He goes up to Ireland to campaign. People don't know what to make of him. He's like, come on, unite. That's how he gets in touch with Mary's family as he writes a fan, fan letter to William Godwin saying, I really, I really respect your views on anarchy and the lack of government. Um, I'd really like to meet you and support you. And Godwin, who always needs money, thinks this young nobleman would be of interest to meet. And that's how Mary ends up meeting him. But Percy would do things like sending political messages in bottles <laughs> out into the sea and send fiery <laughs> kites up into the, you know, so that people would hear the message of freedom for all and justice. And he wrote a very famous poem he, protesting yeah. Peterloo. Do you, do you? All in all, he's the, he's the kind of guy who doesn't deserve to have the name Percy. No. I mean, he's no. not at all that kind of, no. of, of writer wild. and thinker and wild. wild. He, you know, he was he, he was very much uh, against everything, basically, yeah. and lived a, as free a life as he could imagine. And not pay. He didn't. The always interesting contradiction to me is he didn't pay any of his bills either. So there he was, like fighting for the rights of working men, and then they'd like, no, he'd like leave town. <laughs> there was another question here. Yes. This is um, Frankenstein. So F Frankenstein actually is first received most popularly by the French, which I think is really interesting. And we, you know, there's a lot of disorganization in Europe when this book comes out. And so you know, Germany, as we know, it doesn't, you know, it, it doesn't exist. So, but the French are very interested in it, and it be she becomes kind of a celebrity en France. And I don't know when we could really say the first German translation is, and I think that would be, a, that's a really interesting question. I want you to go find out and tell me. I never thought to ask, I never thought to ask, no. Can I tell you one thing about Mary and translations though? Which is so off topic. So Mary always has to make a living after Percy dies. She's always trying to make a living with her pen, just like her mother did. And she does go on and write five more novels, which are all really interesting and not very readable because they're very informed by ideas and not by ideas like how to make a realistic plot and character. You know, she's not interested in any of that. Um, and so at the end of her life, at writing life, the first, the guy who starts the first English encyclopedia, not the French one, comes to her and says, um, I would like you to write the entries for us for the great French authors, the great Italian authors, the great Portuguese writers, and I think also the great Greek writers. And Mary is the only, she's asked, he asks her this, not because he wants to include a woman in his stable of writers, because she is the only woman, it's because she's the only English writer who knows all of those languages. She was so exquisitely self-educated. And she enjoyed doing these entries. She was really a great writer of nonfiction. But these are her hardest works to find because they were encyclopedia entries that weren't signed. So she goes to the man and she says, I really enjoyed this. I think we should do an encyclopedia of women writers. <laughs> and he, of course, <laughs> scoffed at that. And he said, well, A, no one would read it, and B, there aren't any. Yeah. And so, no, thank you. So here's what she does. She writes these sort of palimpsests. She writes, uh, 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 for example, this is, this is my version of her, Michelle de Montaigne. Michel de Montaigne, a great French essayist, was helped by his niece, Marie, a great editor and a poet in her own right. Here is an example of one of her poems in the entirety. So this was very much how she operated. So I think this is so not an answer to your question, but the word translation. I just wanted you to know how Mary Shelley operated as a political activist. She had to figure out a way during the Victorian era to get her points across in a way that was far more difficult than the preceding generation where Mary Wollstonecraft was a famous political activist. I mean, she was a famous radical and so was William Godwin. And actually it was harder to be an activist when Percy and Mary were together and then later during when Victoria takes the throne. It's harder to be an activist. You have to figure out different ways to do it. It was dangerous. She was a language person. 
So Percy knew Greek and Latin, and so that was her first, he was actually her first teacher with Greek and Latin, and then they spent so much time in Italy, and then she believed that every you know, civilized person, oh, I think it was actually Spanish and Portuguese. Um, I, I wonder if, um, did she know Beckford, uh, uh, William Beckford, who wrote Vathek, or Vathek, oh. which is a sort of influence on, 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 you know, it was written 30 years earlier, an influence on Frankenstein, but he wrote a famous journal about his time in Portugal. And there could possibly be That's great. an interest to yeah, that. I never thought of that. that. He might, came to Portuguese literature. Just speculation. Are there other questions? If not, I, I think, uh, oh wait, there's one last question there. That's interesting. Yes. It sort of yeah. makes sense because I don't know. When you ask that question, well, I don't, it doesn't come to mind. Thank you. And it's interesting that timing in 1912. I doubt. Which is about the time that the, there was a great uh, compromise. German <laughs> horror writer Hans Hans Ewers, who wrote novels about creation of kinds of Frankensteins. Um, he later was compromised because he joined the Nazis and wrote the Horse Vessel song. But um, you know, El Rauna, Vampire, and a couple of other books all deal with very much Frankensteinian themes. Hmm. So an interesting uh, you know, juxtaposition of time. Well, oh, in the, in the back, another question still. Vathek, William Beckford. It's an Arabian Nights style uh, gothic romance about a very corrupt caliph and what happens to him. V-A-T-H-E-K. And what way does this point Well, it's, it, it, it leads to his own destruction. He's gone too far. Basically, the idea of, the, of presumption, of going beyond the limits of what is, is proper. He's taken, in a, in a way, you can argue that Frank, Victor Frankenstein is assuming either godlike roles or taking the, the woman's position in a way, which is part of your, your theory, or, or not theory, but viewpoint. Um, you know, he, is, he, is, he, is, he is assuming he is uh, powers that don't belong to human beings. Again, are there any final questions? What's your next book? Which, which, which one of us? <laughs> yeah, yeah. We know what Michael's next book is. I, can't, I want him to hurry up. We have to send him home so he can go back to writing it. <laughs> um, I'm returning to 17th century America. So, yeah. That's all you want to say. Yes. Okay. It's sort of a mess right well, now. You're smart. Well, yeah. Good luck. Thank you. With 17th century America. <laughs>